Well, it was Sunday Night Football, and pretty much all of us thought that it was at least going to be a close game. Most people thought Tampa Bay was going to win. I mean, everyone on the Sunday Night panel thought Tampa Bay was going to win. I predicted Tampa Bay to win on my podcast. I'm going to go with the Bucks here. I wouldn't be shocked at all if it goes the other way. So what went wrong? Well, honestly, everything. I mean, everything went wrong. I've narrowed it down to eight topics. This is going to be a long video, so let's buckle in and let's just jump into it. I counted eight different times a receiver ran a wrong route. Eight. That is an insane number, and there could even be more that you just couldn't tell on tape because obviously I don't get to hear what the plays are in the huddle, so maybe there were more and they just weren't noticeable. But it's honestly not just that. There's also plays like this. It's going to be man coverage that they're going up against, and for Tampa Bay, they have a, it's similar to a mesh concept. You're going to have two receivers run further deep, and then two are going to run just very shallow crossing routes. Uh, kind of against each other where you have Chris Godwin and Antonio Brown those are the two players running those two routes and once this play starts it's working out perfectly I mean you look at Godwin and Brown they're both winning their own one-on-one -on -one matchups pretty well Godwin a little bit more so uh, Godwin is the receiver who's further to the bottom of the screen but he's running up uh, he's winning it a little bit more so and also since the back is currently to Brady's left this now means that he's more likely to throw it to Godwin since there's nobody else in that area, whereas there's going to be more traffic if he tries to throw it to Brown. So what's the problem here? The problem is going to be that really these two receivers just haven't had this experience and they don't really have the chemistry down. They don't know exactly where to go. And the reason why that's going to matter so much is because, you know, there's a defensive player who's trying to follow Brown, but he's going to actually end up kind of getting in Godwin's way. Watch how Godwin has to make him move and sort of sidestep. And then he ends up dropping that ball, but honestly, it would have been a much easier play. He probably could have caught it and gotten the first down had he not had that immediate pressure. And there was immediate pressure because him and Brown just sort of aren't on the same page and don't know exactly where they need to go to make sure that their paths are clear. There was also the interception set up by a bad route by Antonio Brown, I believe. Uh, what's going to happen is you see it on the screen. It's a, it's a cover two zone, but there is a blitz here. So it's a cover two zone blitz. And for Brown, he's running an option route where it's a go route or it's going to be a curl uh, depending on what coverage it is. I listened to all the post game uh, conferences and they didn't really give anything away so I don't know whose fault this was. I think we all kind of assume it was Antonio Brown's fault because this is his first game and Brady's been here for a bit but if it is it's a weird option because there's two safeties deep and I don't know why the option should be for him to continue running a go route if there's a second safety who's deep. I mean, watch, once this ball is snapped, really, Brady should have no business making this throw if it is a go route. So forget for a second if they're not on the same page. This is a dumb decision by Brady regardless. If you look in the other sections of the field, all the way to Brady's left, to the bottom of the screen, Scotty Miller is going to get wide open. You also have Mike Evans, who's currently going up against a linebacker. And meanwhile, if you decide to throw it to Brown, you are throwing it into double coverage. So I don't know what Brady was thinking on this play. He throws it up there. It's still a bad job of, you know, him and Brown not being on the same page regardless uh, because Brown could have at least been in the area, maybe would have had a chance to get it or at least knock the ball away. So either way, it's a bad play uh, just not being on the same page, but also just a dumb decision by Brady to throw it there regardless. I mean, the reality is you're just not going to have that much success in a football game if you're not on the same page with your receivers and if your receivers don't have chemistry with themselves. This might sound surprising, but Antonio Brown had a great day. He really did. I'm not lying. He really had a good game and maybe no more impressive play than this one. So it's going to be a cover two zone. This is a fourth down and six. So, you know, crucial play. It's a cover two zone. There's a blitz. So one less player in coverage. And so if there are two safeties deep, where would you suspect that they're going to cover because worth mentioning new orleans plays a very aggressive zone their players aren't afraid to get out of exactly where they're supposed to be uh to cover someone else so in this zone where should those players probably cover you would probably think the two deepest routes one is gronkowski's route that's running over the middle and the other would be godwin's route that's going to be running towards the sideline on the bottom of the screen and that would be a reasonable thing to suspect uh, and so for Brady, where should he try and throw it to? There's a few 
routes he could try and throw to. Really, Gronkowski's route isn't bad. You know, again, it's over in the middle. Uh, you can see a couple routes that will get into gaps in coverage at a certain point, although nothing is crazy uh, in a good position. But watch this. So you do see that those two safeties, they end up covering Gronkowski and Godwin, just like we suspected. But now if you look at Brown, look at him. So he sees this. He looks up. He sees the safeties are covering two other guys. And so he's going to take advantage of this in a big way where his route is basically just to stay where he's at. But he realizes now he can run deep and get wide open. That's what he does. The safety actually changes to Mike Evans and Brady throws it to Gronkowski and it just overthrows him. And Brady was under pressure. So that's kind of why he didn't give Brown the ball. Uh, which that's something I'm going to get into a second is the pressure. But, you know, that's a tough one, right? Because Brown had an easy touchdown. And honestly, Gronkowski could have had a touchdown as well. And Brady just misses the throw. A lot of that is because of pressure. But I wanted to give some kudos to Antonio Brown. In Pittsburgh, he would do similar things. I remember this play. This was from 2018 against Jacksonville, where it's kind of a similar idea. It's going to be a cover four zone that Jacksonville is in. And Brown's running around. That's supposed to just be a curl route sort of uh, just in front of the two players who will be further deep than him. Once the play starts, Roethlisberger isn't even looking in Brown's direction. But also, you notice how both of those two Jaguars players are kind of running in a little bit they're kind of seeing if they can take away uh that throwing lane to brown because otherwise he would be open so that does make some sense but now brown notices this which is what's so good about brown he's going to then run deep and this time roethlisberger hits him he had a much cleaner pocket and brown's going to end up getting a touchdown despite some uh walkiness going on on the play that was ruled uh pass interference on the defense so uh really good play from brown and say what you want about antonio brown but his football IQ is off the charts, and you would like to see the Buccaneers be able to get him the ball on plays like that. Green Bay destroyed this New Orleans defense largely through plays like that, where you got defensive backs further deep to make mistakes and then capitalized on it. But Tampa Bay wasn't able to do it. And if you want to blame Brady, you can. And if you want to blame the offensive line for not giving Brady enough time to be able to make those reads, I think that's also fair. I think they all deserve blame, quite frankly. This one's another interesting one. Uh, it's a cover four zone. And Brown's running a route that could get into a gap in coverage. It looks pretty good. Uh, and it's going to actually be even better. Watch how once this play starts, Brown is wide open right here. I mean, this is wide open. He could probably get the first down. But also worth mentioning, the two New Orleans players who are deep are once again crashing in to try and take away this route. And so you could think, hey, this is that Jacksonville situation all over again. Brown can just tur turn forward, run deep, and get wide open for a touchdown. The problem with that is Brady is just under pressure. I mean, this is just a tough play for him to make. I mean, there's pressure coming from multiple different sides. Both of his tackles aren't winning this matchup. So for Brady, this is one of those plays where you have to say, yeah, it would have been awesome if we could, you know, try to get a touchdown. But you got to just throw it to Brown now, take the yards that is given to you but Brady's not going to do that Brady tries to scramble but ends up running right into pressure and again if there was a, a better job done by the offensive line that's a touchdown so that's kind of the silver lining I think for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is that when they play teams that don't necessarily have a pass rush they can have Brown who will go off and get these touchdowns but the problem is when they play teams that do have a good pass rush that could be a problem So let's talk about that offensive line. First, let's talk about the players themselves. So these are the offensive linemen. The left tackle and the right tackle have both been pretty good this year. Donovan Smith can be hit or miss, but as a whole, he is a net positive. And Tristan Wirfs has had a really good rookie season for Tampa Bay. The tackles have not been the problem whatsoever. Let's talk about the inside. First, we'll go right to left. Uh, we'll start off with Alex Kappa. He's a pretty good player I mean he's solid he's nothing special he usually is the weak link on this offensive line but he's a good enough player to where when he's the weak link he's not a mess you then have Ryan Jensen who's a pretty good player in his own right one of the better centers in the league uh so that's a good scenario but then on the left 
guard position. You notice that there's a player wearing a Colts uniform on that little card thing, uh, Joe Haig. And the reason why he is wearing a Colts uniform is because last year he played for the Colts. He is a new addition, and he was sort of a sixth man type of guy for Indianapolis. He can play any position on the offensive line, and he is someone that Tampa Bay has confidence in. He is not their starter, though. Their starter is Ali Marpet, who's a really good left guard. And obviously, it is a huge downgrade losing probably your best offensive lineman. Actually, I think definitely your best offensive lineman and then having to play a backup. That's a huge drop-off. But what's going to be even worse is just how he's going to play, but also how Tampa Bay uses him. This plays a great example of it, where you're going to have Jensen pull over to the right side of the screen, and it's going to look like a run, but it's not. It's going to be play action, and they're just pulling Jensen over. This helps sell this play action, and clearly this is early on in the game, and they A, think a play action could work, and B, they want to help sell it by pulling a center over. That can actually be a good idea, but the problem is you're now leaving your backup left guard with a one-on-one -on -one matchup, and Tampa Bay had confidence that uh, Joe Haig could pull these kind of things off, and he's not going to be able to. Watch out, he's just going to get beat here, and Brady's going to, it's going to affect Brady's throw for sure. I don't know if it would have been complete regardless, but definitely that's just getting beat, quite frankly. And New Orleans took advantage of this weakness from Tampa Bay, where they would then do plays like this, where they had a lot of times they would put five guys on the line. Sometimes they would blitz all five. Sometimes they would have one drop back into coverage. This time, they are going to have a player drop back into coverage, but notice how it's the player who's lined up with Alex Kappa, the right guard. This is going to be huge because, you know, in this scenario, you have five offensive linemen. There's five players who could be blitzing. So in this scenario, Tampa Bay is basically just saying every offensive lineman block the guy in front of you. If that guy drops back into coverage, find somebody else to, to hit, basically. And in this scenario, it's now basically going to mean that it's forcing your left guard to have a one-on-one -on -one matchup because Jensen, your center, is also going to have a one-on-one -on -one matchup. And while Kappa will probably then move over to help out your center because you don't want to leave your center with a one-on-one -on -one matchup, this now forces your backup guard into a situation where he has to straight up block somebody. He's going to get beat immediately, and Brady just throws the ball away immediately as well because he realized how bad of a situation that was. I mean, not even one second into the play, and Brady's throwing it away because he just he didn't he didn't have time. Tampa Bay tried to help themselves out by having Jensen go to his left as much as possible whenever he could double team to his left. That's what he would do. But the problem is now New Orleans can simply just put their best defensive tackle on the right and then have a one-on-one -on -one matchup with Kappa, who's usually the weak link for Tampa Bay. Like right here, that's exactly what they're doing. They're going to get the opportunity to double team with Hag and with Jensen, which is what they want. That's the ideal situation because, you know, a center, it's tough to have a one-on-one -on -one matchup and you're helping out your worst guard. But now Kappa has to have a one-on-one -on -one matchup of his own. And that's not an ideal situation either. That's not what Tampa Bay wants to do. And if they had Marpet out there, it's not what they would be doing too often. And watch how Kappa is going to get driven back here. And there is going to be some pressure. So that's just, a, it's, it's not a great situation. It really isn't. And those small things can be so huge at times. Like on this play, it's going to be man coverage. It's a cover one play. And while there are seven players back in coverage, since Tampa Bay has a halfback who's going to be blocking on this play, New Orleans is going to have the player who's covering him also rush the passer. That's how it's going to work. But once this ball is snapped, Kappa just completely fails to pick him up. He does not pick up the blitz whatsoever. And on one hand, it's like, hey, you still do have a halfback who can, you know, block, which honestly, Tampa Bay should have had a halfback or tight end blocking on almost every play. And they barely ever had that happen. So that's another criticism I have of Tampa Bay was it was often just five guys blocking the whole game which I don't think was the correct decision. But also, I mean, you're in a situation right now, going back to this play, where now Brady, who wants to hit Antonio Brown, that was the route I was showing, which is going to the top of the screen, but he's just, he doesn't have time. Brady's gonna run around in a pocket because he has to. And if you look at the top of the screen, Brown was wide open. If Kappa picks up that block, this is an easy first down. Worth mentioning, this is on fourth down. So that's how big this play is. If he gets it to Brown, Brown makes the catch and gets the first down. 
that's a huge swing as opposed to not being able to get it and for brady he doesn't really have too many options he's just gonna throw one up and send a prayer which is the correct decision on fourth down uh gets intercepted and honestly the interception helps them because of field position but doesn't help them in terms of morale uh and it's just not a great uh situation but it definitely could have been a good situation if it wasn't for the pressure you know antonio brown was wide open and they just weren't able to get it there simply because of the pressure however as much as i would love to sit here and say well once they get ali marpet back it'll be fine they can give much more double teams to their right and that'll you know jensen will block more to the right and that'll help out kappa and their line will be good again their tackles weren't great in this game either, and you needed them to be when you have other injuries in the middle of the line. On this play, Werfs is going to be blocking Cam Jordan one-on-one, -on -one, which, you know, I mean, that's it's tough to block Cameron Jordan one-on-one, -on -one, especially when you're a rookie. But at the same time, this is what Tampa Bay needed. If they weren't going to be able to block in the middle of the line, it's going to be really hard to also have Brady get anything going if you can't block on the outside either. Jordan is going to be able to beat Werfs pretty handedly. And so now it's like, what? Do you have to have your... your can you chip him? You can't really afford to chip Jordan on this play because you need your back in a position where he can block on the inside because your inside has been struggling so much and now you're getting giving up pressure on the outside as well the left tackle wasn't much better he was in fact definitely worse even though he had the easier matchup of the two where I mean Donovan Smith he's a good player I mean he really is he when he gets beat it looks really bad but he is as a whole a net positive to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers line, but he had his bad moments. Watch how Trey Hendrickson is just able to overpower him on this one, and he's able to actually get a uh, sack fumble. Brady did recover it, but still, I mean, again, those can be huge swings right there, and you really don't want to let that happen. So the offensive line was not good, and it's so hard to win a football game like that. You hope, if you're a Tampa Bay fan, which I personally am, you hope that you can find a way to get better once Marpet is there but quite frankly the Saints just were better too that's just how it, that's just it that's as simple as it gets and while I do think that it's a completely different story if Ali Marpet is there what does it say about your team if you cannot afford to have one injury it says something very poor so you you that's a real risk for Tampa Bay and they're basically going to need at least they're going to need Ali Marpet and Ryan Jensen to be healthy this whole rest of the way. That's what they're going to need because they can't afford to have two not great players in the interior offensive line. And Joe Hag, who we thought was going to be a good depth player, has not been that. At least he wasn't this week. Okay, this next point is very simple, but very important. Stop throwing the ball to your lesser targets. Stop throwing to Gronkowski every play. Stop throwing to Scotty Miller every play. You have debatably the best trio of wide receivers ever. Antonio Brown, Chris Godwin, Mike Evans. That's up there. That's certainly up there. And you keep trying to force the ball to Gronkowski as though he's still prime Gronkowski. It doesn't make sense to me. Like, let's start off with this one. So, it's going to be man coverage that they're going up against. And the way it's going to work is that they're going to have Antonio Brown and Chris Godwin run routes over the middle. And then Gronkowski's going to run to the outside. And basically, the idea is there's going to be traffic. You can hit Gronkowski. He can turn the corner. And he can run in that direction. That's the way this play is supposed to work. But again, you just have to wonder, why is Gronkowski the guy getting the ball in this scenario? As you see, Brady is able to hit him, and there's going to be a pretty quick tackle. He's able to gain a few yards, but you just can't help but wonder what would have happened if that was Antonio Brown who got the ball in that situation, or Chris Godwin, or Mike Evans, although Mike Evans also isn't the best yards after the catch guy. Really, Godwin or Brown would have made more sense. And I get it, you know, you want to have your tight end be the guy uh, on the interior because it kind of adds to the element of surprise a little bit. But it just, it makes you wonder, why is Gronkowski getting those targets? Quite frankly, Gronkowski just didn't have a good game. Like, on this one, it's going to be play action, and then Gronkowski's going to run over the middle. That's the way this play is going to work. It's a simple concept. We've seen uh, Brady and Gronkowski hit on this before. Uh, but on this time, it's not going to go so well. The play works. I mean, Gronkowski gets open, but he just drops the pass, uh, which is just, it can't happen, you know? And again, it's the kind of thing where I don't really want to harp on this too much because this has worked this season. It's a good play. It just, you know, Gronkowski dropped the pass. He honestly just had a bad game. 
but at the same time it definitely does sort of become a little bit head scratching when the whole point of this team is you have arguably the best trio of wide receivers ever I mean you can literally make that argument and you're running a goal line play without a single wide receiver on there it kind of makes you wonder what's going on and it's not just Gronkowski either but it's just Brady needs to learn to trust these star players sometimes like on this one it's a cover three zone you have Mike Evans running over the middle and you also have Scotty Miller who's going to be running a uh, quick curl uh, it's going to get into in a gap in coverage this is a play that can absolutely work out but what's really interesting about this play is well, why are you looking at Scotty Miller first when really both of these routes have equally good chance of working against zone coverage? And also worth mentioning, it's either going to be cover two or it's going to be cover three. You can't really tell exactly because of where the safeties are aligned. But if it is cover three, then the safety is going to be out of position because you notice he's cheating a lot up to the top of the screen. He's cheating to Brady's right and Evans is to Brady's left once this play starts uh, on the top of the screen Scotty Miller is open like, like I said it's not a bad route against this type of coverage but Mike Evans is wide open look at him he's got a he's he's got a touchdown quite frankly this is a touchdown if Brady sees this and hits him and if Brady was looking at Evans which he probably should have been that's an 82 yard touchdown and that completely changes the dynamic of the game this is a 14 nothing game at this point if they're able to get a big touchdown here it does. It changes the dynamic of the game. I don't think Tampa Bay wins even with that, but at least would have given you a shot there. And the reality is Brady just needs to be looking towards Mike Evans, who actually had a really good day as well. Him and Antonio Brown both got open pretty consistently, and Brady just wasn't looking their way. He was looking at Scotty Miller and Tyler Johnson and Rob Gronkowski's way, and it just doesn't make a ton of sense. At a certain point, you gotta just trust that elite wide receivers are gonna get open and you should look at them far more frequently. So that's the main reason the offense was so terrible. I mean, the offensive line had an injury and they weren't able to make up for it with the healthy guys. And that's not an excuse, that's just straight up a problem because injuries in the offensive line do happen. The receivers weren't on the same page and when they were able to get open, Brady wasn't able to hit them. So basically just everything went wrong. Now let's talk about the defense. So I think this first drive will do a great job at really summarizing this whole game in a sense, where we'll start off with the very first play. It's gonna be zone coverage, it's a cover three play, and what's gonna happen is you have a couple receivers running uh, further in the middle of the field, and you also have Kamara, who's just gonna be sort of a safety valve, he's a check down. This is what Breeze loves to do though, he loves to hit Kamara in that spot we all know this and for good reason Kamara is very good in open space once this play starts you notice that Shaquille Barrett right there he is in a bit of a dilemma on one hand he could stay deep and try and cover Jared Cook and it looks like Jared Cook is running in his zone although actually as we know Cook is going to run further deep so he's in kind of a weird spot where he doesn't want to give up something you know deeper but at the same time he also sees that Kamara is open and if Breeze hits him he could gain some yards not a ton but Shaquille Barrett's in a tough spot so what should Shaquille Barrett do well you know it's easier for us to answer we're omnipotent we know what's going to happen we know that the tight end Jared Cook is going to then run further deep so we know that David will be able to cover him I think regardless, he should just trust that Levante David, he's a great coverage linebacker, he can make that coverage, and Barrett should run over and try and uh, get in the way of Alvin Kamara. That's what he should do. He instead stays a little bit too far deep, which he shouldn't have done, and that allows Breeze to hit Kamara, and Kamara picks up six yards. So, not great. Also, not terrible. You can live with that. It's not the end of the world to give up a six-yard gain to Kamara. It would have been a lot worse to give up something further deep. The problem is going to be you're going to see this overcorrection later on in this drive. We're take a look at this very next one. It's again cover three zone. This time it's not Kamara, but it is a wide receiver who's running in motion. He's going to get similar to that same spot that uh, Kamara was earlier. And you also have a player who's just running a quick curl route trying to get in between two gaps in coverage. That's all he's trying to do here. 
And once this play starts for Tampa Bay, this time you see now it's Antoine Winfield who's in that same little section. He's running over to make sure he takes away a screen pass. He's overcorrecting here, which I don't think it's really that big of a deal, quite frankly. But the problem is that unlike last play where I said that you should take away the screen pass, this time there are multiple Saints players over the middle of the field. Devin White could try and cover the next guy who he's closest to. That's the other player in the black box. But the problem is there's another New Orleans player who looks like he's about to cut over the middle. So White can't just give that up. So it's a really tricky situation for Tampa Bay to be in. The reality is in this moment, you kind of just have to say, you know what, if you're going to take another check down, we'll try to make a quick tackle and we'll continue to do this. We feel okay with running up and trying to make tackles. Uh, but the problem is that there's no one's covering the right guy, essentially. You could also say that maybe Winfield should be covering the check down, but then White should be covering the other player. And, you know, everyone should just find a guy and stay on them at a certain point. But the problem is just that Tampa Bay doesn't know what they should do because they don't play zone very often. This just isn't their scheme. And so they don't know exactly what the other guys are going to do. And so they don't really know where they should go. This is too easy of a throw for Breeze to make. And, you know, for Devin White, you could simply, you could blame him and say, hey, he should have gotten over more. At the same time, it's tough to really blame him, I think, because these players are getting put in a position where they can't succeed because they just don't have the zone chemistry that other teams that play zone for a ton of their snaps have. Of course, later on, the touchdown would happen and it would get set up by, again, this same thing of trying to prevent these screen passes. It's going to be zone coverage. It's a cover four zone. And, you know, you see that if it is a screen, it's fine. It's not the end of the world, but they're just panicking over an Alvin Kamara screen. Once this play starts, you notice all three Tampa Bay players completely rush in to try and take away this screen pass, which is just, it's obviously a mistake. And the only reason that there aren't two wide open players in the end zone is because there was another uh, safety who was deep in that area uh, who was able to run over and cover the other guy. But that still leaves one player completely wide open. Just a mistake from Tampa Bay. Breeze is easily able to make this throw and the Saints turned what was just one small decent play into several good plays further down the field because Tampa Bay was afraid of giving up the small thing and the Saints are so good at saying okay you know you're worried about that we'll just do this then so you know great job by New Orleans for sure for calling the right plays absolutely but Tampa Bay just wasn't putting their players in a position to succeed. I'm going to make one quick excuse. Uh, it's a little bit of an excuse for Tampa Bay defense. This is just one, and it definitely is not uh, absolving most of what happened. It is worth mentioning they are without Vita Vey, who is the best nose tackle in the NFL. That hurt them. It did. It, it wasn't the reason they lost. It wasn't even close to being the reason they lost, but it did hurt them. I want to bring that up for a second. On this play, it's going to be a rushing play. New Orleans is going to have their center one-on-one -on -one block. Tampa Bay's backup nose tackle on this play, uh, Nunez Roaches, who is the backup. And, you know, this is just the kind of thing. No one would do this against Vita Vey. You don't have a center one-on-one -on -one block Vita Vey, uh, but you can afford to do it when you have a backup nose tackle in there. Not only that, but notice how Nunez Roaches does get moved pretty heavily. Again, that doesn't happen with Vita Vey in there. So I do want to be fair. The injury did hurt them, but at the same time, he's not coming back all year. So yes, maybe you can try to say, well, it's only because of the injury. But you know what? Every team's been injured. The Saints haven't had Michael Thomas for most of this season. Uh, you it, you got to find ways. To, you got to have depth and you got to have players who can step up. So it's worth mentioning, but it's not going to get better at any point throughout the season. So I think that's actually concerning for Tampa Bay. It's gotten talked really to death at this point. The fact that they were playing zone coverage on defense so much when they're not really a zone coverage team. And honestly, it's still worth talking about in this video because it doesn't make any sense. And instead of me talking about it here, I'm just going to instead hand it over to my podcast self. Uh, I did a podcast right after this game. I was not happy. And I think I said it pretty well then. So I'm just going to go to that clip. It was it was infuriating. And uh, I tweeted about this because it was the most frustrating thing uh, I've experienced in quite some time where we have we're playing zone, just play a base zone coverage, play after play after play. Because, you know, Drew Brees, uh, it's not like he's going to be able to find the soft spots in the zone. Uh, and it's not like he's the most accurate passer in NFL history or anything where he's going to be able to make those throws. <laughs> 
like on this one so this is zone coverage and not only is it zone coverage but Tampa Bay has an extra player in coverage so it's only a three-man rush you have eight players playing coverage as opposed to the typical seven so the hope is that it will take Breeze a while to find somebody open however about a second and a half into this play notice how there is someone open immediately because it's so easy for the Saints to find these little zone busters they run zone busters all the time Breeze knows the spots in the zone and also Breeze is really accurate and he's not going to miss these types of throws. This ends up being an easy throw for Breeze to make and they're able to, you know, get the ball inside the five. Now, Jared Cook fumbled it, so it ended up working out for Tampa Bay, but it's a good example of showing just how bad this zone coverage is, especially against the New Orleans Saints. They were running weird coverages too, like this. I believe this is a quarters coverage if only two players covering the middle and it's a blitz which doesn't make sense to me unless someone just missed their assignment and there was a cross up which is possible because it is a defensive back it it makes zero sense and you have Michael Thomas running a route that's going to get over the middle uh and this is just it's again it's too easy for the Saints Breeze takes the snap he sees oh hey I have a wide open Michael Thomas that's cool I'll make that throw immediately because that's an easy throw for me to make uh and again you're just putting the Saints in these easy opportunities to succeed. You know, there's they say you want to put your players in position to succeed. Well, Tampa Bay not only didn't put their players in position to succeed, but they did put their opposing players in positions to succeed. Michael Thomas is known to be one of the best zone coverage receivers in the NFL. Drew Brees is known to be one of the best zone coverage quarterbacks in the NFL. You are known for playing really good man defense and being able to pressure uh, the quarterback through blitzes very well. So why are you just playing basic zone coverages and basically just playing right into their hand? If Drew Brees won the lottery on Sunday, that would be the second luckiest thing to happen to him that day because of how lucky he was to just walk in there and see that the Buccaneers were playing the absolute dumbest coverage they could have against him. This two-play sequence is just awful. So first, it's zone coverage again. And again, it's only a three-man rush, which... So again, with a three-man rush, you expect it's going to take Breeze a long time to find something open. And the hope is that maybe he won't even realize it's a three-man rush right away and still make the throw with the amount of time he typically would not make and potentially you could get a turnover or something. That's a hope, right? Look at how poorly this is going to work out. Breeze takes a snap and in under three seconds, he's able to throw the ball more than 20 yards down the field to a wide open receiver despite the fact that there was an extra player in coverage that's horrible you cannot let that happen and again it just it makes no sense to do that but what makes even less sense is what's, is what's going to happen on this next play i remember when i watched it and then they finally showed the field and i could see that it's clearly man coverage i mean you see winfield is on the side uh players playing press this is clearly man and i was like okay finally we're going to start playing some man coverage and then i looked at the quarterback and saw that that's number seven Taysom hill is in at quarterback and that's when they finally decide to play man, which is just so silly because Taysom Hill can run with the football really well. And now you have five players who are going to turn their backs away. You should play zone against Hill and you should play man against Breeze. Uh, and it's just a really dumb decision. As you see, Hill takes the snap and he's going to be able to run outside the pocket and pick up a huge game. It's an incredible play from Hill without a doubt, but that's what Hill does. And that's kind of my point is you're putting the great players for the Saints in positions to succeed. And it doesn't really make any sense to me. For a second there, I thought that maybe it was just one of those situations where you decided to go say, okay, we're going to play man straight up now. And maybe you weren't able to, uh, you know, get a different play in because all of a sudden Hill's behind the quarterback instead of Breeze. Taysom Hill was in the game on the last play. So that's possible, but they went right back to playing zone right after this. So I don't know what the point of that was, and it, it just makes zero sense. Although with all that being said, I have to be honest, when they played man, they weren't great at that either. Like, let's take a look at this one. This is an interesting sequence where what you're going to see is that it's man coverage. And so there's two backs in the game. You have Levante David covering Alvin Kamara. Now, it's tough for any linebacker to cover Alvin Kamara. I mean, it's tough for any defensive back to cover Alvin Kamara. He's really good. But what the Saints are going to do is they're going to have a receiver kind of get into David's way, and then Kamara runs to the outside. It's essentially a pick play. Uh, 
it's it's not they usually won't call this a penalty as long as you don't actually make contact if you're the receiver so you know it's a good play for the saints and levante david who's usually very smart at these things it looked like he was just a little late in realizing what's going on on this play breeze quickly hits kamara david was a little slow in getting over there it's a nine yard gain not great obviously not a disaster either but not great either However, later on, a very similar thing would happen, where it's we're now inside the five, and the Saints are going to run the exact same play. So, you know, Levante David, who is now on the side, whereas earlier he was uh, on the inside, now he's on the outside. Now, for David, he's trying to let his teammate know, hey, be aware of this little swing to the outside, because I just missed it, so make sure you don't make the same mistake I made. And while that's definitely smart to let his teammate, Kevin Minter, the the third linebacker in this group know that it's not great when you aren't able to then get in position yourself and while he does get mentor over he just isn't able to get in position he didn't realize the ball was snapped right away and gives up an easy, easy touchdown on his own end so again that's kind of just how this game felt on defense was tampa bay was just five seconds behind on every play they it felt like they were five seconds behind another great example would be probably what was tampa bay's best play of the night where it's on to fumble, but this wouldn't work out particularly well either. It's man coverage. Tampa Bay is actually just going for it here. They're playing cover zero. I think they just wanted to get some immediate pressure on Breeze, which makes some sense. Uh, and what's going to happen is that you have a few receivers running to the outside. Uh, one's going to run over the middle. There's a bit of chaos going on in that uh, section on the bottom of the screen. And Tampa Bay, this isn't going to go well for their defensive backs. Breeze takes the snap, and somehow there's some sort of cross-up. There is a New Orleans player who's wide open, and there's two Tampa Bay players covering another guy. One of them just got confused, and they blew their assignment. Breeze was throwing in that direction. It ended up being a fumble recovered by Tampa Bay. But, you know, if, if Breeze uh, doesn't get hit there, then that's a huge gain. Uh, so, again, Tampa Bay, it was a lot of... A lot of it was mental mistakes. It really was. They didn't get burned that badly on too many plays. Now, they still did get burned. Like, I do want to be fair to the Saints. The Saints were the better physical team as well, but it wasn't that drastic. It wasn't 38-3 to better in terms of the skill, but it was 38-3 to better in terms of the strategy. It really was. And also, to the people saying, well, they screwed up in man as well, I still think that's what you should have done because you know what? Yes, they screwed up on that play, but Breeze also fumbled the ball. Why did he fumble the ball? Because you blitzed. Why did you blitz? Because you were playing man. So you're able to blitz more when you're playing man, and I think that's what Tampa Bay should have done. They got away from who they were on defense, and it backfired in a huge way on offense. They didn't give their offensive line help. It was just a mess from start to finish. That's what I think. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this longer video i had i actually had fun making it despite the fact that it makes me want to cry with how bad the Tampa bay buccaneers played but you know what it's it's actually it's actually okay and this is kind of like therapy for me this this video so hope you guys enjoyed it and of course as always have a good one